This is the Poet in the Poem from the Library of Congress. I am with poetry's legend, Maria Maciati Gillen, and she's going to read an opening poem. Okay, my fifth grade teacher, Miss Spinelli, taught us kindness. I loved her for her dark, tragic eyes, for her hair as thick and curly as mine, for her husky voice reading stories and poems, for the way she walked down the dusty aisles of PS number 18 and touched our shoulders or the tops of our heads, for choosing me to read aloud, for encouraging me to write, but mm -hmm. I was so shy, I barely spoke. In that classroom, she carved out a space where I could be safe, where nothing, not the shouting boys on the playground, not the hatchet-faced principal, not the petty meanness of the girls, not the older boys in black leather jackets could do me harm. I still see her looking at me as though I were her beloved child, her face, even after all these years, wrapped in a veil of shimmering light. The voice of Maria Mazziati Gillen. <laughs> Maria, you know, our teachers that gave us kindness will live forever. Miss O'Malley, Maria, Miss O'Malley in the fourth grade saved my life. Maria, let's talk about that kindness because do you think she gave you the baton, your magic wand that you've been dinging on people all these years? Let's talk about the beginning of the Patterson Poetry Center, a Passaic Community College. Just how many years ago did you get that idea? How did you first get that idea? And how did you get it started? Well, it's, it's 42 years old at this point. And it actually is more like 45, but I count the official opening when I first got a grant for it from the New Jersey State Council on the Arts. So that I think is the official opening of uh, the Poetry Center. I, I got the idea because I, I was one of the editors of a magazine that was started by an outside professor at Passaic County Community College, and then he left and I became the main editor of it. And it was called Footwork then. I know it well, I know and it well. Remember it? And I do. I go around the table and to everybody would drop it. We'd, we'd be collating it by hand and then stapling it. And then gradually everybody else would leave and I'd be there by myself, collating and stapling. And um, I started doing readings with the, by asking my friends to come to read for nothing. So it wasn't until I got the grant from the state council that I was able to pay poets to come, small amounts. My first Maria, grant, five hundred dollars. I uh, remember the things that only I, one person, saw were poets in the schools, awards to books, workshops, readings, and I'm just one person. How many poets do you think have gone through your rooms up there? How many in forty-two years? A thousand, two thousand. Um, if you count the poets who come to take the workshops and the poets who come to listen, several thousand people have gone through at least. Uh, as far as the presenters, uh, there were probably I don't know. I can't multiply very well. Twenty times forty-two. But you know, Maria, one person did that. It always takes one person to have the wish and the passion. So we're talking to Maria Maziati Gillen, and she is the greatest citizen in the Poetry Republic, but she's the greatest poet. So give us two poems together so we get a sense of you, a real taste of you. What do I know about grief? How death would follow me like a determined lover, taking first my mother, my father, my sister, my best friend of 42 years than my husband, more friends each year. How his bony finger would point at the next person. Once I walked in a, into a spider web and I think grief is like that. It catches in your hair and your lashes. My friend's husband died after a short and brutal illness. They were as close as two spoons. When he died, she told me she had always been happy. 
just to be in the apartment with him, even passing him in the hallway, felt like an act of love. And the weeks after my husband died, and the months waterlogged with tears, I thought I would not survive. But gradually, I began to imagine that he came back to visit me, a shadow in the corner of the room, a presence sitting in a chair beside me, though of course he could never stay long. I am comforted by his ghost self. I'm sure he's telling me that he's content in that other world where I cannot touch them. I am grateful there is a door through which he can pass to visit me, even for a moment, his ghost hand on my cheek. Maria Maziati Gillen. Let's hear another. Okay, going shopping. I used to go shopping with my daughter when she was a teenager. I hate stores, hate shopping. Everything takes time. I get bored. But I've been shopping with my bored daughter because she wanted to go. I loved watching her try on clothes, loved seeing how beautiful she looked, marveled at the perfect bones of her face. What I did not know about shopping could fill the Garden State Plaza Mall, but I could not deny her anything. We'd get inside a dressing room and all my common sense would fly out the door and I'd say yes to everything as though I could make up to the child who still lives inside me for all the clothes I could not afford to buy. When I was young as she was, when I was as young as she is now, I wanted to give her the life I never had, an upper middle class life tucked into a silver box with a silver ribbon. Looking back, I remember how happy I was to watch her try on clothes we bought, how happy that she looked nothing like me, the, the kinky haired foreign girl that I was. I had to yet to learn that all her beauty and grace would not protect her from what waited for her outside the circle. I had drawn around her. The voice of Maria Maziati Gillen. Tell me about telling the truth. You've written about it. You've taught it. You demonstrate it. How are you able to tell what you feel and believe that it is okay? It took me a long time because I was trying to hide behind language and images and references to Greek gods. And then a graduate school professor said to me when I was about 40, he said, you know, it's in this poem about your father that you find the story you have to tell. And he really opened a door for me. So it gave me the courage to think, well, maybe somebody would be interested in the story of a woman's life, a daughter, a mother, a granddaughter, a grandmother, a, uh, a person who is was born poor, who lived in a tenement, who uh, did not have all the material things she wanted, but had instead parents who loved her, who gave her everything they could in terms of love and warmth and support and food. So I, I look back and I think how lucky I was that I didn't know it then. You know, Maria, you have given the world the go ahead to say, this is my life. It's the only story I know. I hope you will accept it. But I think you are like one of the progenitors in this culture who has shifted the energy of poetry so that we have the courage to speak. And I am behalf of all the poets to thank you for that. It gave me more courage and I, I give other more courage. Others now can do it because of you. I think you were one of the very first when I heard you read at the Dodge Festival some 40 years ago, maybe. Yes. <laughs> and you read about your elementary school. I said, she is for us. She is the teacher. She's the master teacher. And I want to tell everyone that you've written 24 books. You are Professor Emeritus from the University of Binghamton, CUNY, and, and run the poetry program at Patterson uh, the Patterson Center, which is all I have to do is say it. And every poet says, oh, yeah, I've been there. I've been in their book. I've been in the Patterson Review. So what do you think about your life, Maria, as you look back I'm on it? I'm thrilled, aren't you? I, when I was growing up in that tenement in a cold water flat, and my parents didn't speak English. I didn't speak English when I went to school. I, I had lots of dreams, but I never thought my life would be this, 
this. And it just proves that anybody can do anything. My mother used to say, you just have to decide you're going to do it and you can do it. And I really think it's, she's right. And I've tried to teach my students that you just have to decide you're going to do it and you can do it. You just have to keep moving forward, putting one foot in front of the other, and, and you can accomplish great things. And I feel very thrilled. I've been all over the world to read my poetry. I, I've been back and forth to Italy probably 30 times to read poetry, to teach poetry. I, I am very excited that this is my life. I'm so pleased that the way the Poetry Center uh, developed and grew, I'm so proud of the Book Awards and the Patterson Literary Review and the Allen Ginsberg Awards, all the things I started, which were a little idea, and then I turned them into big ideas. You know what that's like, Grace, because you're a person who takes little ideas and turns them into big ideas. And I think I wrote a book called Writing Poetry to Save Your Life, how to find the courage to tell your stories, your stories. And I think that that's what I've tried to do in my teaching, to say, these are your stories. They're only your stories, but if you tell them, give other people the opportunity to tell their stories, they want to tell you their stories when they hear yours. And I so love you. I love you. I love you, Maria. That's all I can say. And you've written 24 <laughs> books of poetry. And give me a break, your visual art is like nothing I've ever seen. It is your <laughs> perimeter. Nobody could do it like you do. It is like a, uh, like shadows of your own self. So you've got art books with your art, I think two of them out, and your poetry. So do you think that there's a limit to how much love we can get from humans and that maybe we need to go to the art to find the true love inside of ourselves? Why is it we go to art? We to learn. We have to learn to love ourselves. We have to learn to love other people. And I, I think that we lead very circumscribed lives if we don't learn how to love other people and not be jealous of them. I, I've mm. seen people who get jealous. If somebody gets something, I never get jealous. I, I just feel happy. If a student of mine gets to be a full professor at Howard, I'm thrilled. <laughs> what I know. But in the beginning, we were, I think when we were younger, we had the first pangs of jealousy. I think in the beginning when we might've had the first wish of ambition and, oh, look, they got published and we didn't, but it didn't take long to know there was enough to go around. There's enough of right. everything to go around. And if we could replace the word judgment with compassion, we would be Maria Gillen. Now, Maria, read us two more poems. Okay, I'm going to read my son, the lawyer, quote still in Thomas to give me courage. After I lose my balance and fall, smashing my nose against the hardwood floor, I slip in a huge puddle of blood, try to stand up, but my feet keep sliding. I've always loved mystery stories, read about people stabbed to death, but never thought about the blood, how the murderer could break his neck sliding in it. After the hospital, after the x-rays, EKGs, the four-hour drive to Binghamton, after I teach my class, looking battle-scarred. I think of my son who used to tell me I should co cut back and give up poetry, proving that he did not understand anything about me. When I talk to him on the phone, he is shocked to hear defeat in my voice. I am always optimistic about everything, even in the middle of calamity. But today I am brought low by the recognition of my own frailty. My son, the lawyer, the practical, pragmatic one, says, how many of you women your age have a life they love, work they love doing? Later, he sends me a quote from Dylan Thomas. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. I repeat the lines over and over to myself, grateful to, have, to the son I was sure didn't understand anything about me. Ha ha, John, you came through. John, the lawyer came through. Well, Maria, when we talk about the truth in poetry, how much blowback did you ever get? Did you ever get a bad review? Did you ever have to fight for what you believed? Did you ever have to... Um, did, did it ever come to you as um, 
a difficult thing because you were so courageous and so honest? Yes, I, I mean, I got plenty of blowback. I, you know, there, there, uh, there's a whole school of poetry that believes that poetry should be obscure, unclear. Uh, I always think of it as poetry for five white guys from Harvard written by five white guys from Yale. And so those people hate my poetry. I thought that there are whole magazines that would never touch my works. On the other hand, I have magazines, who, editors who love me and I'm happy with them. I'm happy that they understand what I'm trying to do, that they write to me, that people write to me, people tell me their stories. Isn't that the most important thing that we open? Poetry is for people, it seems to me. It's not for intellectuals, it's not for a select group. I never remember once the president of the Academy of American Poets, this is many, many years ago, maybe 35 or 40 years ago, saying poetry had never been more for more than five people. And oh. I think such a BS. I wanted to strangle the man. He wrote it in the <laughs> I couldn't kill them uh, because it seems to me that when poetry reaches people, it shows us our own humanity. It shows people their humanity and the way that they're we're connected. There's so much divisiveness and ugliness in the world. And the more that we can connect through the art, through poetry, through music, the more our humanity comes to the fore and the more kindness and compassion we show to other people. I, I know you understand that because you are one of the kindest, most generous oh. people I know. Oh, Maria, did you ever know when you were five, five years old and sort of scared that you would change the world? Well, I don't think I changed the world, but I think I changed a lot more than I thought I was going to change. <laughs> I, I think that I've had generations now of students who have come through my workshops and who have worked with me and who still write to me 20 years after, 30 years after, say, you've changed my life. You've changed. Aww. Okay. Isn't that what we want to know? That we changed somebody's life? that we changed somebody's uh, trajectory in their life, that we gave them courage. That's what I wanna know, that I gave them courage, that they were able to find whatever story they had to tell. It was not my story, but it was their story. And if they could lay claim to it, they would, they would claim, lay claim to their own lives. I've seen you in action. I saw you teach and you would just clear out the underbrush and find out what was the kernel of the story. And I have done that in my own life. You are the master teacher. Let's hear two more poems. Okay. Um, Ma Flanders, C. Louise and me. Uh, my Flanders, of all the characters in those novels I read when I was still young and in grad school. It's you I remember, flamboyant, sensual, in love with life. You always look for the main chance, and I can barely remember a name five minutes after I hear it, remember yours. I knew you were self-serving, but I love that you never lied about it, that you never made excuses. I imagine you trying to make your way in 17th century England where a woman on her own would have been vulnerable. You remind me of my Zee Louisa, that woman who married four times, who wore a tan colored corset with lace stays that had to be tight, pulled tight to hold in her large breasts and belly. Who loved to dance the tarantella, her whole body exhilarating and moving and stomping. And though I know Mal only through a book, I know Louisa Louisa from my childhood, watched her move like an armored vehicle through life, <laughs> had three dead husbands and onto a fourth handsome elegancy to Elmo, who lives in a small apartment above us on 17th Street in Patterson, New Jersey. My mother told me that in the light night, she'd hear Zee Louisa crying, but in the morning, Zee Louisa would come down the back steps, her cotton dress stiff with starch, her lace handkerchief tucked in her sleeve, and she'd be smiling and laughing. She never told my mother what sorrow she carried hidden in her sleeve. Girl, girl, world does not want to know what sorrow you brought in the light in the night. Before you read your next one, I want to say, please, listeners, learn how to write a poem. She started with Ma Flanders and she puts in Louisa. She inserts a knot in the middle of the bow and then the bow fans out again. 
that is a way to write a poem. Keep going, Maria. Okay, watching the bridge collapse. On TV, I watched the bridge collapse as Minnesota rush hour, cars and trucks suspended over water, cars swaying and falling. Imagine what these people felt caught as they were in their cars, listening to music or all things considered or to a mystery on tape. Imagine we were failing, their failing families waiting for them, the dinner bubbling on the stove, the TV programs they planned to watch when everything they knew, everything they believed they could trust crashed and broke beneath us. That final moment of disbelief and then the terror as they fell. Sometimes I think all of us, all our lives are like that. <clears throat> we really believe we are safe. The roads we travel built to last <coughs> and are shocked no matter how many times it happens when the ground falls away. That moment in slow motion when we're walking confident, strong through one day and the next instant when he fall, stupid and helpless on the floor. Mm. It was like that when you got sick. Can it be so many years ago? We were young. We loved each other. Our children were smart and healthy and beautiful. How could we lose? Then one day you could swim a hundred laps in the town pool, who could bring in even in midwinter snowstorms, begin to move slower and slower. Your hands no longer functioning the way they always had. Your legs unwilling to obey your brain's command. And now your head bent sideways so nearly touches your shoulder. Your legs so weak they cannot hold you up. Your voice thin as a set thread. Now you even need your aid to feed you. We hang on like those cars that trembled and swayed at the edges of a broken span. As frightened and unbelieving as those people must have been on that Minnesota bridge when everything they believed about themselves and the world turned out to be wrong. Nothing between us and terror as, except air that suddenly seems so thin we cannot breathe. There's another example. You start with one story and you insert another story and then you fan out to the to the original story, which gives it layers and richness and truth. And, you know, I am so glad you read that because I was thinking it's so random, Maria. Maria, life is put down the book because I can't see your face. That's it's so, so random. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you, you, know, you, can, you, can, you can plan your life to a T. You it's can plan bad. everything. And by God, then Laura Boss will die. Then Laura How Boss would die. I don't understand. How could Laura Boss die? Really, the most living person there was. So we have to just keep writing and keep keep these people memorialized and keep uh, preserving and making things permanent. Marie, don't you believe? I think that's what poetry does. It, I, when I say it saves your life, I mean it saves the people around you. Uh, it's so many people I love, Yerga Han. I, I have to say, I don't know if this is sad to you, happened to you, but I've lost a lot of people in my life. And uh, I, the older you get, the more people you lose, unfortunately. So in a way, by being able to write about them, I hope I bring them alive again. And they seem as real as they still are to me and as they always will be to me. You said it. You said it. Maria. Maria Maziati gillen is here with us today. Tell us about your latest book. Who published well, it? Uh, these, wait a minute. Stephen S. Boston State University Press in Texas um, published it, and they're wonderful press, and I was very thrilled when they took the book. Uh, it's called when, when the Stars Were Still Visible, and um, it has a painting of mine on the cover is very obviously my paintings are very primitive I'm definitely a self-taught artist <laughs> but I'm having a great time painting I have to tell you well I'll call you a, an American sophisticate instead of an American origin a primitive because you're if you're famous for your painting so listen take it take it well let's hear two more poems okay I'm going to read meatloaf, meatloaf and hamburger helper <laughs> Growing up, my mother cooked macaroni and gravy, meatballs, brajola, spinach, lentils, lentil soup, roasted chicken and potatoes, made zeppoli, 
big salads fresh from the garden, zucchini with rosemary, meals so delicious I can still taste them, though my mother, mother has been dead for more than 20 years. When my kitchen children were growing up, my mother-in-law taught me how to make American food that my husband liked because he grew up on it. So I learned how to make pot roast and leg of lamb and stew and roast beef. She taught me how to make meatloaf, which was cheap and could be used for one meal plus sandwiches. She taught me to make meal with ham meals with hamburger helper, which my mo mother called that junk. Years later, my stomach turns at the thought of hamburger helper, the gre greasy feel of it, the fake chemical taste of sauce and spices, flavors created in a lab. But when I served those meals, so it's different from anything my mother ever cooked, I felt I had arrived in middle-class America, that I am now belonged in the land that almost guaranteed you died of heart attack before you could reach old age, and not the land of my father, too poor to buy all this meat, even if he had wanted to. My father, who died at 92, sitting in the sun in his garden, the aroma of tomatoes and peppers and zucchini, perfuming the air around him. Oh, Maria, that is beautiful. Just beautiful. I love the fact that you came to, you became a wasp if you were able to do hamburger helper. That right. is great. And are you, are you a good Italian cook now, Maria? Are you a good Italian cook? Well, I was, I, you know, I, the thing is I now have a helper. Now I have an aide, so I don't cook very much anymore. Uh, and but did you bring your your mother's recipes into your family when you were uh, a nuclear yes, family? Yes. And my daughter, my daughter is a very good cook, and so she makes the things my mother made. But I can't stand up that long. So. <laughs> so. But you want to you do more sitting down than ten people do sitting standing up. Let's have another poem. Maria Mazziati Gillen is here with us. She has told the truth and taught all of us to do the same. This is called claiming my true name. It took me years to claim my true name. So many years layered in shame. So many years trying to hide <clears throat> my good self and my true name. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I have allergies. I'm having trouble. Do you want to start over? No, I want to drink a water and perhaps a cough drop. <laughs> yeah. It must be spring. It must be spring with these allergies. Yes. Looking back, I know what I wanted when I saw you, love, that first time at your friend's house. You with the blonde boy's looks, your handsome face, your wide great eyes, your big white colonial house, your educated American parents. Did I imagine that by marrying you, I could erase all those Z's and T's in my name, change it all like an old coat? I could give away and put on instead what I thought was the sleek, sleek Americanness of your name. I'd be able to erase my ethnic face, my frizzy hair. I wanted to deny the foreign girl I was, the one who didn't speak English when I went to school, deny my Italian parents and the cold water flat, leave them all behind and slide right into the light of America that I was sure I wanted. Years later, I realized that I'd trade away everything that shaped me, trade away this song that beat in my blood, the aroma of the ethnic foods I loved. And only then, staring into a void as big as the Grand Canyon, did I claim my true name. I wrap all those Z's and T's around me and force people to lose my true name, even when they stumble over it and they have to ask, is this the way you pronounce your name? And I put that. <laughs> pronounce it for them, waving the air like a banner, proud of my Italian self, proud of all the things that mark me as unique, as different, a foreign clean creature who can at last claim my true name. All those Z's and T's become a banner around her. Before we read a final poem, what is a life in poetry worth? Oh, everything. I have been so lucky. Don't you think you've been lucky? So lucky to have this life. Uh, really very lucky to have it. I, I don't know what I would have done without it. Uh, and so, you know, I'm very thrilled to have it. I'm very thrilled to 
uh, know that I've been this lucky. Uh, and and I, I think that you must feel something of the same thing. It just feels as though we were given a gift and uh, somehow you don't, re you don't recognize the gift you're given um, and, and there it is for you. Wait. Do you think when we were little, because we were outsiders, it gave us more energy and passion to, uh, to be aggressive and assertive and change things because we felt we were outsiders? Yes, I do. All that pain of being outside, of never being inside the circle, in a way made us much stronger. I am not afraid of anything at this point. <laughs> I'm always shocked. Some upper middle class, very elegant, very sophisticated woman uh, is a friend. And then I discovered that she's afraid of everything. And I'm afraid of nothing. Oh. Just get out of my way. I'm going to get this done. Get out of my way. I'm going to get this done. I'm going to put that on your tombstone. Let's have a final poem. Okay. And it's terrible because I've now lost the poems I was going to read. I don't know what I did. Honest to God. I sometimes think, well, I hope I haven't totally lost it. But sometimes I think that it's not as easy to have on, hang on as I would like to think. Um, just wait a second. I have to find a short poem. Well, you know, we have time for the pelican. Is that available? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. I love that poem. I'm sorry. I cut it, actually, so that I could read it. Uh, so I tried to cut out part of it. And this is from Silence in an Empty House, which was, I think, the, the 24th of your books or the 23rd of your books. Silence in the Empty House. Yeah. Here we go. Maria Mazziotti. Yeah, I was watching the pelican die. I, on TV, I watched the pelican with its mouth wide open its wings and body coated with oil. Is it screaming? I do not hear the sound. And since this is a photograph, I don't know if it was caught in that mouse shaft howl when it died of its howling in recognition that cannot survive the thick coat of oil that bears it down. Ladies who take care of you when you're gone or you say you're having trouble, these hands, they say, when I come home, I see your hands have turned black at the tips the ends of your fingers eaten away. I watched the dead bird in the gulf floating on top of the water, its body drained of all motion, all light. The announcer on CNN says, BP didn't want the photographer to pay, take pictures of the dying birds covered as they are with the black slick of oil. They were hoping, he said, the birds would sink and the evidence would be swallowed by the ocean. And late afternoon, I hear my daughter cry out, I rush to see what's happened. You are stretched out on the bed. Your body, body's so thin, you look like a boy. I call 911. The ambulance takes you to the hospital. At the hospital, they want to know whether we want extraordinary measures. No, I say, he has a living will. We hover around while they admit you. You have forgotten how to speak. Most of you lie in bed, staring into a space above our heads. In my mind, I see the screaming bird. I reach out to hold your hand, stroke your forehead. Dennis, I call out, do not hear me. The neurologist comes in, he says, he should have been dead five years ago. What did you expect? You shouldn't have taken such good care of him. We did everything we could, the BP president says, looking directly at the camera. We don't need to stop deep water drilling. Our economy will collapse if we do. Uh, the social worker tells me, you should put him in a nursing home. My brother tells me, you kept him, kept him home all this time. If he gets a little stronger, I'll let him go home and he'll be around the things he knows. The neurologist enters and says, he's not going to make it. The soldier, social worker admonishes us with her bag of common sense. She does not love you. We take you home. I sit next to you and hold your hand. I'm in so much pain, you say. They have not complained before. I think it feeds you a jar of baby, baby applesauce. You open your mouth and accept the food. When I see the pelican on TV, its mouth wide open in horror, I remember you as you're dying. On the Gulf, the earth and the sea are being destroyed. 
just as you were by this disease that finally defeated you after you struggled against it for all those years. Some things are bigger than all of us. We cannot defeat them. Is if there is if there is enough carelessness and greed in the world, even the ocean can be destroyed. And you fought against this illness with such courage, even you cannot survive the back and blackened tips of your fingers, the oil heavy on the bird's feathers, the bird's dead and floating on the surface that gradually sink and disappear. The voice of Maria Maziati Gillen. This is the program, The Poet and the Poem. The program is produced by Forest Woods Media Productions, post-production by Mike Turpin, MET Studios. We wish to thank the Library of Congress for making the program possible. Funding is provided by the Nevada Foundation, Sinipid Fund, Avi Deshashani, and Sandy Jackson Cohen. I am Grace Cavalieri, and our engineer is Mike Turpin. <laughs>